let me just uh, uh, invite uh, Matthias uh, uh, to the floor in then uh, from uh, Bucknell University, uh, long time standing uh, colleague, friend. Uh, uh, <coughs> we are all uh, happy and proud to have him uh, on board. And uh, he'll be talking about the global inflation uh, for us today, uh, resolving the mystery behind it. And we are all eager and excited to have him on board. Uh, Matthias, welcome, welcome home. The floor is yours, please uh, go ahead. Uh, and uh, we, are, uh, uh, we are also recording uh, uh, the event, uh, right, Oktay? Uh, I cannot see. Yes, by all means. With your all permission. All right. Okay, well, thank you, Erinj. Uh, I was the other day I was thinking, yeah, I think uh, the first time I met you was at SIPA, something in SIPA back in the late 90s. So it's been more than 20 years. I, you know, time flies, you know, it's it's an amazing thing how fast things go. Uh, one of Lance Taylor's projects in which you were writing with uh, Korkut Boratov uh, uh, on the Turkish case and I was writing on the Brazilian case. But um, so thank you for the invitation to Range, to Saber, to Octay, you know, for organizing the whole thing. Uh, this is based on, so it's a little bit of a, a follow up that I'm trying to write with uh, Stevan, who is around too, uh, uh, on, on the sort of current debates on inflation, mostly in the US, but with obviously a bent on, on issues on, on peripheral countries and something on Latin America. Uh, and it's uh, uh, a follow-up on something I wrote for uh, this journal called Catalyst that I wrote a year ago when this debate started. Um, that was called the inflationary puzzle. That that was the 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 thing I sent. I'm I have here a cutesy title, which you know, uh, just for the joke of it, price and prejudice: uh, the return of inflation in ideology. So. So at any rate, uh, it, it is trying to do two things. Uh, think a little bit about uh, the the theoretical uh, sort of views on 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 inflation, and also uh, look at least in this one, look more carefully at the uh, basis for what I see as the dominant uh, view in the U.S. and the alternative view, uh, which. And um, that's why I suggest that there is the return of ideology in a sense, and you may very well complain. I, I'm, I'm, I'm doing it just for for rhetorical purposes. But you know, I think that there there has been sort of a a divide in which uh, almost everybody, including <laughs> the neoclassical people that are seen as progressive, people like Krugman and and you know, have moved to see inflation as purely demand driven, um, and or fundamentally demand driven. And the left has been seeing it as a as a result of of uh, corporate greed and 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 issues of distributive conflict, which would give a very different sort of understanding of of inflation. Which I think we're at the center, not just of heterodox views of inflation. I'm not just saying Bob Rothron back in the seventies. I'm saying even people like Tobin was very clear that distributive conflict played a role in inflation has sort of vanished from from the debate and i think that that's uh, th that's a problem in in the current in the current circumstances because i think it it gives a uh, uh, a different sort of perspective on the dangers of inflation and and my point or the, our point in this is that there is an excessive uh, uh, an excessive uh, um fear of the dangers the social dangers of inflation and and not enough of the consequences of anti-inflationary policies so what i'm going to do is discuss a little bit the the current dissensus you know those views on inflation uh in the current debate try to evaluate mostly what i think it's the dominant view in terms of the policy response which was to assume that it was too much demand uh, and then discuss a little bit the differences between uh, center and periphery. Uh, if Esteban is there, he will probably complain that I, I have a view that it's too much based on Argentina and not on, on some of the other Latin American cases. And um, yeah, and I tend to have views that are more driven by Brazil and Argentina, I suppose, than, than by the other countries. So, and Argentina is an outlier, admittedly, in the case of, of uh, inflation. So uh, I do think that by the seventies, if you if you if you look back what people thought about inflation, 
uh, there was a, a relative consensus of what inflation was, theoretically speaking. Uh, uh, there is a, a very good sort of, you know, concise description of that consensus in my view in 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 a p little paper that it was actually written for the New York Times by James Tobin, uh, and it's published in some book with collected sort of papers. Um, in which he says, you know, it's the title is very expressive. There are, it's called "There are three types of inflation, and we have two. You know, and yeah, you know, it was you have demand pull, cost push, and wage price spirals, meaning conflict, you know, uh, inflation. And and he says we have two. We have cost push, and we have uh, distributive conflict inflation. And and that was, you know, I think uh, the sort of um, broad consensus. That consensus, of course. If you want, uh, camouflaged uh, a significant and important dissensus uh, on what were the relevant sort of causes of inflation in the real world. So, Friedman definitely did think that uh, inflation was demand driven and that the solution was, and then it was monetary and that you, you know, had to control, you know, uh, demand through monetary policy and and you know and perhaps fiscal austerity. But he never denied the possibility of of cost push inflation or even the existence. He he was harsher against. I, I would say he probably did deny uh, the idea of conflict inflation. Uh, but my point is that you know the consensus, at least on the Keynesian side, uh, was encompassing enough that slightly less conventional people, people like uh, you know. Uh, John Robinson or, or Bob Rothern in, in Cambridge, you know, and, and Bob Rothern, certainly Kaletskian Marxist, um, the ideas, in, you know, uh, of uh, conflict and inflation were, were very well accepted by, by, by uh, the mainstream Keynesians, at least. So, so, uh, so that was the state of inflation uh, theory back in the 70s. And and of course, I'm not even going to discuss there the policies, why it came down and this and in the other. But uh, I think the great moderation, the long period there of low inflation um, from the 80s onwards caused some sort of uh, lack of understanding, particularly in the mainstream of the causes of inflation and, 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 and broke down that old consensus. And when when the acceleration of inflation, you know, uh, in the in 2021, you know, in the after the pandemic sort of uh, recovery was well into, you know, its way, uh, it seemed to limit the debate within the mainstream to to the notion that inflation was demand driven. And not that, you know, I mean, Krugman, you know, if you look at the beginning, he would accept that there were some supply chain issues. But, you know, the main debate of whether this was permanent, persistent or or uh, temporary, uh, which seemed to be the debate at the beginning, was whether the economy was close to full employment or not. So whether whether, you know, the dangers of inflation were high and this would be permanent because we were already at full employment or not. And, and if you look at the debate, it's a debate. Uh, Politically speaking, it was within the Democratic Party. It wasn't, I mean, Republicans are not even part of this discussion. It was Larry Summers versus Krugman, you know, and, and Krugman, by the way, came up uh, this year at the beginning saying I was wrong and it is too much demand and we were close to full employment. My mistake, uh, Larry Summers was right. Larry Summers had a, you know, a victory lap. He he went to all the newspapers. He's been writing more for the, the Washington Post and said, Fundamentally, this is uh, too much demand. We were way beyond the output gap. You know, would imply very high levels of inflation. The central bank is, you know, the Fed is behind the curve. They should hike the rate of interest significantly. By the way, he's moderating. He published today in the Washington Post, somewhat moderating this view, saying that perhaps now we have reached a point in which we don't have to continue hiking it, or at least not as harshly as before. So, so perhaps there is a a softening of that argument. But but that was the state of, I think, of the consensus and even some heterodox groups uh, suggested uh, things that um, were similar. Um, so let me see if I can pass. There you go. So uh, just to give you some flavor of how heterodox people have been saying some of these things, and and I'm gonna talk, uh, I was here for the, the Kregel talk on MMT and so uh, MMT, 
um, I think that there is something important about uh, MMT. MMT, I see them as the branch of post-Keynesian economics that has gotten significant press and political influence in the United States. Um, the political influence, at least through the um, impact on, on the left or more progressive side of the Democratic Party through Bernie Sanders and Stephanie Kelton as an advisor and so on and so forth, but also significant press because of Warren Mosler and, and you know, they are all the time in the Wall Street Journal and, and so on and so forth. And this is actually from a piece that was published in the Wall Street Journal that Randy Ray's uh, sort of um, comments uh, that he didn't write, but, you know, he was cited explicitly. And, you know, um, ju just to quote, he says, Mr. Ray points out uh, it wasn't uh, when trillions in benefit checks landed in bank accounts last year that inflation went up. Prices went up uh, when the recipients went out and spent money. Money doesn't cause inflation. Fair enough. Mr. Ray argues a view that infuriates monetary economists. Probably true. Spending causes inflation. Uh, in other words, it is you know money is endogenous. Fair enough. So it's not Friedman, but you do have that is excess demand. So it's demand driven inflation. Demand pool. It's not cost push. And the solution, by the way. Uh, is to hike taxes. So the hiking of the taxes is to reduce demand. And he's hiking taxes on the relatively poor. He's explicit in that same piece. He says that you have to hike the taxes on the relatively poor because they have higher propensity to spend. So it's consistent. So uh, so for whatever reason, the, the reading of what is the problem in the American economy is very conventional. It's the idea, it's more Friedman, say, than Tobin. Uh, when you look back into the 70s debate, which is peculiar. Uh, the challenge to this view uh, does not come, you know, from, from uh, MMT groups for the most part. It comes from, uh, you know, I would say closer to what we would call radical economists. So not, not post keynesians per se. So uh, of all sorts of varieties, I don't think that they're as uniform. So I, I hear side two that I, I, again, all of these people that I have great respect and, you know, I, I'm not suggesting it's a disagreement over the both the theoretical interpretation of what's going on and also on the reading of the empirical sort of, uh, you know, um, evolution you know, of, of the you know, data in, in the United States. Uh, Robert Reich, on the one hand, and I cite also here Jayadi Gosh. And, and so Robert Reich here is from, from The Guardian. And he says, corporations are using uh, those increased costs of materials, components, and labor as excuses to increase the, their prices even higher than resulting in bigger profits. Uh, and in the same vein, Jair Gosh says that there is a direct link to the inflation causing so much uh, havoc across the world, especially among already poor populations, driven much more by profiteering by large companies and financial speculation than by supply shortages. So it's more the profiteering uh, and it's an excuse, uh, and it's not the cost push. Stuff. So cost push is there. So great. At least on this side, we're saying that it is cost push. But um, there is an element here that suggests that um, this was brought uh, by by you know greedy corporations. So my sort of uh, the the joke of price and prejudice is that the current debate is tied on on these two views that it's the evil government and it's transfers that cause too much demand or the evil corporations that you know are trying to profit and you know beyond uh, what's reasonable and why you know uh, if you ask me by the way while i be on the side of the radicals that corporations are greedy and you know there is something that can be done about that uh, it's mostly about the income distribution. So I don't see, um, you know, uh, policies that can be pursued. And we can talk later on about that uh, as a, a, a efficient way of reducing inflation. And and I'll say why. Uh, wow. At any rate, um, the EPI has looked at this. This is from Josh Bevins, who did the PhD with me. And he's the chief economist at EPI. And again, another person that I have great respect and he looks at this and says, you know, if you look at, he looks at two periods here, uh, you know, the, the more recent period of acceleration of inflation and the long period that came before. And you can see that, uh, so the, the, the long period is the light blue. So you see that the light blue, um, you know, corporate profits over the long period from 79 to 2019 didn't increase much. 
you know, uh, or the increase in prices were not associated to increase in corporate profits. Uh, it's essentially, you know, unit labor costs. Uh, so prices went up with wages. Uh, and to some extent, the non-labor input costs. So, uh, you know, other costs that might be, you know, which would include, you know, the inputs, the commodity prices, energy, so on and so forth. Uh, whereas when you look at the more recent period, that's reversed. It's fundamentally corporate profits. Uh, you know, there is some significant element uh, of of um, non non input, uh, you know, uh, non labor input uh, costs. So energy is prominent in there, uh, and you know, very little in terms of wages. So. This is interpreted in a way uh, that, you know, he says something to the fact that corporations have been channeled into raising prices rather than the more traditional form that, you know, they did before, which was suppressing wages. The other thing that I want, this is from the national accounts, it's not difficult to reproduce this, uh, this data, but what they're, they're looking, they're not telling you causality here. What they're telling you is if you break those components of what went up in prices, you know, these are the components. Of course, if prices went up, say, of oil, you know, because the price of oil went up because of the war in Ukraine and, you know, and natural gas and oil went up and Exxon is producing, say, you know, uh, oil uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, the international price is what they get. And of course, their profits, you know, their cost of production didn't change because they are still, you know, getting the same oil from the same technology in the same place. But their profit margins went up. Uh, inflation didn't cause that. You know, it's not the, the profit margin that caused inflation. It's the, you know, it's the inflation of the price, the hike on the price of oil that caused the profit margins. So sure enough, the data just corresponds to that effect. I should say that Josh does say it is unlikely that either the extent of corporate greed or even the power of corporations generally has increased during the past two years. So that is the exact point. So. It is, of course, possible that corporations could cause. So I'm not saying that it's impossible, the radical idea that corporations may eventually cause higher prices. But, you know, that has to be because there is a change in the structure of, uh, you know, of oligopolistic of the market structure that it's very hard to say that it happened. So it seems that in this case, that's not what's going on. And, of course, there is the, uh, I would say, added sort of theoretical uh, question that uh, the fact that these prices, you know, under oligopolistic conditions may be associated to higher prices that in competitive conditions does not imply that, you know, you will have inflation. What it does is it suggests that uh, the um, price level will be high. But, you know, if if you want to have continuous increases in prices, you would have to have some explanation for um, the continuous changes in the market structure, you know. So uh, the example that I give in, in the older paper was to show that this era here, so this is, it's too small perhaps for you guys to see, but it's the 1860s to 2020. And here's the spike of inflation. I mean, our terrible inflation is this little spike here, which by the way, now it's coming down a little bit. And I'll talk more about that in, in a second. I haven't updated this graph. But um this is the Gilded Age era. So the Gilded Age era, and this is zero, by the way. So the Gilded Age era is a period of catalyzation, so more oligopolistic structures, and of deflation. And it's not difficult to explain why. You know, the reason is that although, yes, corporations and cartels could have higher prices, the level of prices was higher, the weakness of labor during that particular period and the lack of wage resistance implied that they didn't need to increase prices all the time. And the rationalization of the process, the more you know, efficient use because of scale and this, that, and the other, allow actually for deflationary pressures over the economy in that particular period. So it's the weakness of labor that matters in this particular period to explain uh, the deflationary pressures. The point is you can have inflation with a, a more competitive and a more oligopolistic uh, you know, market structure. So per se, the oligopolistic uh, story, I don't think holds water to explain the recent spike in this, you know, two years of inflation seems to be um, 
driven by the pers correct perception that corporations have too much power and that has hurted uh, you know American and global society and that they should be taxed and I think they should be taxed for again reasons of income distribution with a story of of uh, the causes of inflationary um, um, you know acceleration. So before I even start the demand story, which I think is the dominant, it's the yeah, and it's certainly the one that has been policy relevant. Part of the story, I think, it's very clearly associated to to uh, the fact that we had an economy that was uh, you know based on you know supply chains that are dispersed globally, that depend fundamentally on on just in time techniques. That those things with the pandemic, they you know generated snacks, imports uh, in in transportation, put on top of that the war in the Ukraine and the hike in the price of oil, and, and you have the perfect storm in terms of the acceleration of inflation. So these are not very different. The shocks not very different from the shocks of the 70s. So in this respect, Tobin was better, and Tobin and Rothern, if you prefer, were closer to an explanation of the current inflation uh, and the origins, at least, um, of why we had this inflationary spike, which I think it's very different. So the, the original title of the other paper was supposed to be, you know, not the inflationary puzzle. It was supposed to, uh, that that seventy show. And my point was that this is not that seventy show. And it's not that seventy shows for some data I'm going to show on on the weakness of of labor. Uh, again, so this this looks more like a second gilded age in the sense that labor has been relatively weak. Uh, so. I have no doubt that this has been a fast recovery. So, so kudos. Yes, uh, the sort of uh, fiscal packages were large and fast. Uh, in the case of the U.S., not only they allowed for recovery in unemployment, employment, I should say, in about uh, two and a half years rather than six, uh, you know, more than six years in the previous recovery. Uh, but they also they have very positive effects on on things like child poverty in the United States went down. <laughs> you know, the the indicators of many sort of social variables because of of these sort of transfers um, were were you know uh, very positive in terms of natural experiments that show how social policies can have a sort of positive effects. It's very hard now. For anybody to say that direct transfers for the rel targeted, in fact, I'm not a huge, I'm, I'm, I'm an unreconstructed sort of lefty, and I think that social policies should be universal. But you know, targeted policies, and these were targeted policies, were very efficient in eliminating, uh, you know, uh, some of the maladies that you know American society, you know, has and shares with develop the developing world. You know, people in the streets. You know, people that you know, children that that you know, don't have enough food and so on and so forth. So those things did vanish in the United States. But you know, it was a fast recovery, uh, as this sort of thing shows. The question is, it's a fast recovery to a situation that was hardly, you know, a particularly strong situation, and. It can only be this, you know, uh, seen as a, a strong position uh, when we look at particular data. So, of course, if you look at unemployment rates in the U.S., there are 3.7 percent, or whatever it is. I don't. I think it's still 3.7, and they're relatively low. I mean, by any sort of historical standard, that would imply full employment. Uh, however, when you look at this is the employment population ratio, you see that the peak was. Back in the you know uh, early two thousands, at about you know whatever that number is, sixty three percent, I think it is, and there is a clear decline. So every every recession brings it down, and you never go back to the previous peak, and something like that already happened. So we're plateauing at a level that it's below the previous peak, and it's about sixty percent. So there is a consistent trend down in the uh, em employment population ratio. And this is just one measure. You can go participation rates, you know, what, whatever you want to look, uh, the numbers look uh, particularly sort of green. If you look at manufacturing, manufacturing jobs were stuck at 17 million jobs for almost 30 years uh, from the late 60s until the early 2000s. Then with the entry of China and the WTO, there is a disappearing of about 5 million manufacturing jobs in the United States. And those have not come back. And it's hard to think that even with uh, now the bipartisan policies that started with Trump and have continued with Biden, 
that there'll be a significant change in that. There is some discussion of reshoring of of certain uh, industries, particularly chips, because it has security sort of concerns. But still, the numbers of manufacturing that wouldn't sort of make for the whole of five million jobs that were lost. And 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 even there, I think that you know it, it's to be expected that a, a good chunk of the supply chain will move to places like India and Vietnam rather than back into the United States. So, um, so the return, at least in the labor market, you know, that they tell you the labor market is very tight. So Larry Summers has a recent paper showing that, you know, uh, the labor market is very tight. And I'm going to show wage data also to try to suggest that that's not the case. Um, you know, it, it, it's hard to defend in, you know, with, with evidence like this. So I, I don't think that you can say that the labor market is incredibly tight in the United States. So 3.7, the peculiar thing is that it used to be the case that when you, you, you know, a funny thing that you, you used to say 30, 40 years ago to Americans was, you know, you ask, uh, you know, what's the unemployment rate in the U.S.? And it was whatever it was, say, in the early 90s, it was 6%. And you ask, so how is unemployment in Mexico? And they think, oh, Mexico has to be worse than the United States. And, you know, it's 12%. And I says, no, buddy, it's like 2 3%. Why? Because it didn't reflect the actual situation of the um, Mexican labor market. That is true of the United States these days. The, Mex the United States uh, unemployment rate is more or less uh, what the Mexican unemployment rate was 30, 40 years ago. It does not reflect the actual situation of the labor market. So 3.7 is not full employment, interesting enough. It's very low, but it's not full employment. And the same can be said when you look at um, capacity utilization. So this is the rate of capacity utilization for the economy as a whole. It's true if you do it also for manufacturing. Uh, and you can see also it's milder, but there is a trend there uh, that it's sort of uh, very clear, uh, you know, that it, it keeps going down from... You know, something that it's closer to 80% to something that it's closer to 70%. And again, here the recovery is pretty fast and, and you see the recovery and we recover more or less the same peak as before. So so at, at least in that, in that respect, uh, there seems to be a, a return to better than in the labor market to uh, the previous sort of peak in the American economy. But this is a previous peak, again, that is sort of a subdued and not particularly strong here the question is, and I admit there is a whole debate on this, I'm not an expert on this particular debate, whether there is a new normal lower capacity utilization rate in the American economy. Um, and there are many Marxists here. And so this could be obviously tied to a discussion of whether what you were seeing here is also a question of what's happening with the rate of profit, the equilibrium rate of profit in the American economy. And I'm happy to have that conversation. So maybe that's the case. Of course, there is also an interpretation that just says that this is slack of capacity and that the capacity is somewhat endogenous, that you know there are hysteresis sort of effects and that it's because we've been having less uh, expensive macro policies that have pushed the, you know, the current capacity utilization down and that more vigorous uh, expansionary macro policies would both bring up this sort of participation rate and this capacity utilization. So without completely resolving that debate, so I'm, I'm, I'm leaving that debate somewhat open. My point is, it, 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 it seems clear to me that the recovery, although fast, is to a situation that suggests that the economy is not at full employment, at full capacity, and that there is some slack uh, in the American economy. Uh, so harder to, you know, <clears throat> suggest that um, that uh, in, in that respect, that inflation was demand pool inflation. If it is cost push, as I'm suggesting, so if it is this nags associated to the pandemic and demand pool has less relevance. So the important thing that to complete the picture is, well, what's happening with conflict inflation? The third there of the old consensus of, you know, the, the Tobin idea that inflation is either demand pool, cost push, and, and conflict. And he said back then it was two, it was cost push and conflict. When you look at conflict, there is, it's invisible here. So these are strikes, uh, you know, uh, large strikes, you know, more than a thousand workers from 47 to 2021. And 
there is a spike and this spike is not minor that's the funny thing you know it's been revealed uh, you know when when you sort of shorten the thing it, it's a significant you know uh, sort of it goes from zero to i don't know how many you know it's it's 20 something you know per year or something like that so there is a spike there is unionization of of um, starbucks and amazon so there there is a new movement uh, you know there is a large strike in universities in california um, that you know significant impact um, but obviously when you look at the in historical terms uh, you know the the great moderation in, in in many ways is explained by this graph so here you have in the 80s the complete destruction of the bargaining power of of the working class in the United States and 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 this is what explains the relative stability and this spike here doesn't suggest that we are on the verge of of um, escalation of of the um, um, you know conflict in American society and that wage resistance would bring back with this you know um, the wage price spiral which was behind you know a, a lot of the um, acceleration of inflation and the high inflation in the 70s so this is the basis for me to say that this is not that 70s shows this is something this is something else that it's going and um, that is going on and so let me pass to the other one and uh, wait I have this in the middle now and um so now to think a little bit of the differences between center and periphery, because uh, while my point is that uh, with this, if if it's cost push, and, and I'm going to say more at the end, at the conclusion, but if it's cost push and, and there is little uh, distributive conflict and it's not demand pool, the policies of the Fed have been misguided. So there is no reason to hike interest rates in the way they did. Uh, very fast, faster than any other sort of uh, recent historical period, I think, or any historical period in the history of the Fed, uh, we, which, you know, by the way, already visible in, in with effects on, on the housing market, which has significant importance for the American business cycle. So all of those things suggest that this was uh, overkill, in my view, quite the contrary to what most people say. Martin Wolf wrote saying central banks are right in doing this and so on and so forth. So... Uh, in the periphery, I think that there is the reverse sort of problem. Uh, so there is a, a, a much better understanding of the reasons of inflation being associated to supply uh, factors. I think uh, there is also significantly more wage resistance. So if you have a place, I don't know how it's in Turkey, but in Argentina, if you have 100% inflation, you know, and, and you have a left of center government like we do have, a, you know, a, uh, Alberto Fernandez, you know, uh, might not be the most lefty of the Peronists, but, you know, his vice president is Cristina, so it, it is a left of center government. Um, wage resistance implies that, you know, the the unions come and, and we do provide large sort of readjustment of wages. So there is an exchange rate wage spiral uh, going on. This is acknowledged. The exchange rate is, of course, uh, depreciated heavily because we have on the one hand, or have had for a long period, relatively low interest rates with respect to the American rate adjusted for risk. So it, you know, it is the expected depreciation. It's so much larger than the remuneration of assets in pesos that, you know, everybody bets on dollars and that pushes further and further the expected depreciation that translates through tr tradable prices and imported goods into higher inflation. And that requires wage adjustments, and you end up uh, having a wage exchange rate spiral. So that's alive and kicking in, in the developing world. And so uh, that is a 1970s problem, not very different from you know the price wage spirals that the advanced economies had back then. Um, so so uh, in developing economies, there is something to be said about hiking interest rates and, and trying to um, preclude uh, the depreciation of the exchange rate, which in our countries, and that's a different discussion, but you know, also have contractionary effects. So, so those things, those old structuralist ideas, you know, that uh, Lance Taylor and you know Paul Krugman, of all people, sort of defended back when, seem to be you know still part of the the canon, uh, relevant the relevant part of the canon in the discussion of of inflation in the periphery. So I don't think that that has changed. 
but you know, again, when you look at some heterodox groups, and so Warren Mosler, for example, was uh, so I had Randy Ray, so I'm gonna put Warren Mosler here. He was invited to Argentina. He was uh, down there and gave several talks. And this is from uh, again a newspaper interview, so it's not a paper he wrote, but he's being quoted here, and mm -hmm. and he suggested the problem of Argentina is fiscal, not external. So I'm suggesting, obviously, the problem is external. We don't have dollars, and that's why the depreciation sort of keeps going. And we don't have dollars because we run persistent current account deficits. And on the financial account, which is more important, we have very low remuneration for assets in pesos. Uh, you know, he says that the measures that you know need to be taken is floating exchange rates, permanent zero interest rate policy, zero. Uh, they were in nominal terms. This is, you know, something fantastic. I mean, it's hard to wrap your head around this. And implementation of job guarantees. And which, by the way, if you implement job guarantees, a good part of the basket of consumption implies tradables and imported goods, <laughs> you know, and creates and furthers the problem that you have, which is external. Uh, so the 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 notion that this would not lead to an acceleration of inflation and significant contraction of the economy is, you know, it's very difficult to defend and, you know, to exaggerate that, that this would happen. So here you have another thing that seems to me to be um, a paradox of, of this stuff that you have in the center, you know, people like Randy Ray suggesting that we should hike the taxes on the relatively poor to stop excess demand. Uh, because that's seen as inflationary. And in periphery, they go and say, uh, you know, go and devalue your exchange rate with no problem. That's all good. And keep interest rates uh, zero. So so both seem to be um, very counterintuitive to me, given the current circumstances, both in the center and in the periphery. So uh, and, and that comes again for what I think it's my misdiagnosis of what are the causes of inflation in the center and the periphery. So in the center is cost push with no conflict in the periphery. It's not so much that the cost push, which we certainly do have, but it's the conflict. And yeah, and that conflict is reflected in the exchange rate wage sort of spiral. So, so way, uh, cost push and conflict remain important as in you know in the 70s but you know in the center and in the periphery and so uh, and i think that the breakdown of the old consensus of what was inflation in the last uh, 30 years has sort of uh, been very negative for our ability to to respond to inflation so um to to conclude so a uh, couple of things that i i want to point out and and this is mostly about advanced economies but you know th this is a graph that you know um so yesterday i, I was reading mark weisbrod had a piece that uh you know it's on cpr on his website but uh he, he published it in whatever i think it was the um the los angeles times and oh oops um and the um and that piece he he, he he had looked at uh, the compounded, uh, you know, uh, annual rate of change in in prices. So I, I did it, you know, he he did it for the last five months together, and the inflation was I think two and a half over the last five months annualized based. When when you compounded, you know, Fred allows you to do it automatically, so you compound the annual, you know, on a monthly basis. So when you compound that on a monthly basis, it's actually below the target. It's below below two. Uh, in the last month. So inflation has decelerated very fast. I'm not suggesting to you guys that, you know, so, and you can see the hikes. The hikes were, you know, at some point above 14%. So th there were clear hikes here on the on the inflation pressures uh, during the last uh, year and a half. And inflation was certainly m much above the the sort of uh, threshold of the 2% that it's the, the target. But, uh, but at the same time, th those shocks have sort of vanished pretty fast. So, so I'm not suggesting that those will not come back. So God knows. So the war in Ukraine may p persist. Uh, the um, shutdowns in in although they have abandoned the zero COVID policy, the shutdowns and the changes in the supply chain may be with us for a while. So, so that may not have sort of vanished. So I'm not suggesting that there will be no hikes like this again. But at this point, it seems that inflation actually is within the target if you have it analyzed for the case of the United States. And more importantly, not only it's within the target, but that target is absolutely you know, arbitrary. Uh, 
Blanchard wrote uh, last week on Financial Times that now he's not advocating for a 4% uh, percent target. He's advocating for a 3% percent target. But I'm pretty sure if you ask him what's the difference between 4 and 3, he cannot tell you what's the difference between 4 and 3 or 2 or 8. You know, the famous paper, I'm old enough that I remember the paper by Bruno and Easterly. And their threshold, and I'm, I'm not I'm not defending that we should have 40% inflation. What I'm saying is they couldn't find any effect of inflation above, you know, below 40% on economic growth. They cannot tell you precisely what's the effect. It has distributive effects, of course. The poor people will be less protected. And so the distributive effects are the important ones. But in terms of growth, there is no, and, and hence on the efficiency of the economy associated to these targets, uh, you know, the idea of 2%, 3% uh, seem an exaggeration. So uh, the danger, in my view, is that uh, the, this overestimation of the evils of inflation may lead to contractionary policies that will remain in place for much longer than necessary, and not only lead to stagnation, but also promote uh, the kind of redistribution and inequities that are already entrenched in societies after 40 years of neoliberal policies. So that's uh, that's what I have to say. I hope uh, you know uh, it helped think a little bit about inflation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matthias. Uh, excellent. Yes, thank you. If I may, I'll just jump in. Yes, and I I'll just, uh, I think I have a few comments disguised as questions, or maybe, you know, questions disguised as comments. I'm not sure. You'll figure it out. Uh, so the first question that's, you know, since this whole thing started is, and you use the word misguided as well, right? The interest uh, rate increases are misguided. I'm fine with that. Uh, but what is the deal here? I mean, uh, are they worried about inflation? Uh, because, you know, if you don't do the interest rate hikes, it could get worse. Or is it because, you know, a couple of you know, things. It, it's not popular among the waters, you know, come election times, you know, come the, you know, uh, presidential, the next presidential elections or whatever. Or rather, that little spike that seems so small uh, at the end of uh, your graph in terms of the strikes. But if you put it actually into like, you know, the 2000s, it's actually a really huge spike, right? Uh, so in that sense, uh, is it more of a uh, fear that this could actually get out of control and labor can actually start uh, gaining some power in the US? And you mentioned Starbucks and Amazon. I mean, these are... Uh, you know, these I don't know what to call them, but they have really strong maybe signal effects or whatever, you know, brings ideas uh, to the people, especially after the pandemic. Uh, so that's, you know, that seems like it's like it's mostly, and if you read Powell's comments uh, after each interest rate hike, uh, he's always talking about like how labor market is doing and how they need to like do something about it. I mean, if you look at the you know stuff that you showed, the labor market is not particularly strong. But this other part, I guess, is what's what's kind of scary. Uh, if 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 labor starts to getting you know get... the only thing that you know that I might add to this picture, maybe in that sense, is there's also the financial market side of this. And if you look at the uh, whatever asset you look at uh, during the pandemic and in the, you know, they're like going almost vertical. And it means that, you know, they're going to, you know, at some point they're going to crash like really hard. So this, it to me, it seems like there's some sort of like uh, attempt to also uh, engineer a soft landing in that uh, as well. <clears throat> or at least, you know, like stop that increase for a while until... You know, it's sort of like, I don't know, it's never like in line with the real economy. We know that, but still, at least, you know, a little bit like more in line with the real economy. So there's there's that part. Uh, and then second, that 2% target. Uh, in Turkey, we had, we started inflation targeting in the 2000s, and then our target was 5%, which we never hit, you know, mind you. And like, and we never changed it either. 
And we gave up on that last year. But if you go to the central bank webpage, it's still 5% probably, you know, that target is, even though inflation right now is 100%. But going back to the US case, to me, it always seemed like uh, it's not inflation targeting at all. It's unemployment targeting. Because what they're targeting is unemployment, uh, not inflation at all. So, you know, I don't know if anybody did a study of this, but if you read through all those like uh, committee meetings and the minutes and stuff like that, uh, the one indicator that they are obsessed about is the unemployment rate or the strength of the labor market. And, you know, as if there's, you know, there's this idea that the, as if there's like always conflict inflation, you know, all the time and stuff like that. And we know that's not true. They know that's not true. So uh, there's this, this, this power, the, the bargaining power, the power of labor argument seems much, much more uh, convincing to me at least. Uh, so that's one thing. Uh, when you come to the periphery, uh, if you could expand on, you said like uh, inflation in periphery is like most of the time uh, conflict inflation. Uh, so maybe we can, we can maybe like play with that a little bit, I thought, because uh, well, first of all, periphery is periphery. So that's like, you know, we've got that problem to begin with. Uh, and then you've got the problem of, you know, some sort of, you know, import dependence always depends on the country we are talking about, but the import prices are important, hence the exchange rate is important. But also uh, export prices are important as well in the sense that if you're integrated with the world, you know, uh, even if it's domestic products, it's the world prices that you're following. So if the world prices are going up uh, or if the exchange rate is going up, then the prices have to uh, go up. So it's, it's like, it's definitely clear that there's something else going on in the periphery. I'm not quite sure if we should call that a conflict inflation or something else inflation or some other conflict inflation. Uh, I'm not sure. So if you can just like maybe expand on those things, you know, that, that'd be helpful, I guess. Sure thing. Let me first uh, share another thing because I jumped this. So uh, I don't know if we can, can you see it? Do you see the graph? Because I'm not seeing it. I, I don't know what's going on here. So it's the graph. We of, were just, uh, we're, we're seeing the Fred graph on average. The Fred hour. graph, yes. So this is a CPI and average wage. Uh, so it's the wage increases in the, in the economy as a whole. So mm -hmm. you can do this for, for the non-supervisory workers and they're slightly higher because there has been um, uh, an advantage for, you know, certain subcategories, you know, in, in the, and the same for manufacturing, they're slightly higher, but they're both uh, from the middle of, uh, you know, the pandemic uh, losing against CPI. CPI is the dotted one. And so uh, wages were, for the most part, not winning by much, but they do win. And there is a spike here in which wages are actually going faster at the beginning of the pandemic, you see, uh, again, CPI. And then we have a reversal and, and from, you know, really the period in which inflation accelerated, uh, you have that CPI goes uh, much higher than than wages, so so that's the other part that I I try to suggest that I think that the labor market is not at full employment. So not only you know there seems to be a slack, the employment population ratio, participation ratios are not there, but wages also are not out of control. So this is not wage inflation in 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 the United States in and other advanced economies. I think ILO had a report, the the last report, and it more or less is the same for advanced economies. So. So the first, the, you know, just to complement uh, something I had said before, and I, I sort of jumped and didn't talk. So, I, so uh, of the, your first two two issues, you know, <laughs> that uh, what what is that they're trying to do, and you know, with Powell, and and I think Larry Summers is very sort of important in this because I think Larry Summers signals a lot of what the American elites and Wall Street want to to do, sometimes more clearly than than Summers. And and Summers is Summers wrote a paper not long ago that suggests uh, you have to love Summers. You know Summers, the, you know, said uh, three years ago that post Keynesians and people like Tom Paley are right, and you know there is really no sense of full employment. All of this is perhaps wacko, and we're wrong. 
And then he writes this paper in which he shows that um, a good chunk of what happened over the last 30, 40 years is the the you know breakdown of unions and bargaining power. So so I'll I'll say he's of a generation that actually did understand political economy in many ways. So uh, and so I think uh, w when you see him pushing very hard for these policies, I think he's pushing exactly for what you're saying. So that they have a concern with not strangling the the hand of the labor you know of the working class that they want to keep unemployment and and those labor variables uh, under control so so this is not a mistake so i'm not suggesting that they're making a mistake it's not a mistake in the i think it's a mistake from my policy my political perspective but i don't think that they're making they, they're making this unconsciously so i think that they know very well what they're doing uh, so that that should be clear in the presentation, and you're absolutely right. So I don't think it's a mistake. I think that uh, Bob Polin has written on how, if you read the the minutes, I think, or he said at least in some conference that I was that if you read the minutes of of the Fed, it's like reading you know Marx and Engels having a conversation. <laughs> yeah, and it's true. They're very explicit about how it's class conflict, you know, that that drives this stuff. So, and that's why I said it used to be something that. Tobin didn't deny that class conflict was central to this discussion as much as Bob Rothman didn't deny it. Is that that is not said explicitly anymore? And and what concerns me is that even some you know uh, you read Stephanie Kelton's book on 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 you know on on the deficit myth, and she says two things that, that cause inflation, and it's demand pull, cost push. There's no discussion. The word conflict doesn't appear. And she did the PhD at the new school, and you know, and that that's concerning. My point is concerning. I think neoclassical people don't say it explicitly, but when you look between the lines, those that are more policy oriented, like Powell, like Larry Summers, they're very clear on what they're doing. So I I, I wouldn't disagree with you. So I I tend to agree with you that that's uh, that that's the point, and and I do think that they. They are afraid of, you know, so they 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 do want a soft landing because this is an economy that has been driven by so interest rates have been low. They have been incredibly low for 20 something years. So uh, and obviously then capital is not gaining, you know, uh, on the basis of the remuneration of financial assets by that way. So the way it is, it's bubbles. It's asset bubbles. And so this economy lives on asset bubbles. So a crash uh, there forces them as it forced every single one for the Fed to come and rescue and whatnot and engineer the next bubble. So that's the way they so I, I do agree that those two things are part of how the class conflict has been sort of uh, evidenced in, mm. in in monetary policy so i think that it's engineering bubbles in the financial market asset bubbles that keep uh, the wealthy wealthy and keeping the labor market uh, you know in, in a situation of relative slack uh, as to compress the but yes you're right and and they i think that they are concerned of all of these things like starbucks and you know my point to you is that when you look historic you know the dimension of that graph you know it, it I mean we're talking of a little spike that you know it's it's um it's frustrating you know for for those of us that know the history of the the, the labor class the notion that this is you know a resurgence of the labor movement is um I mean it's 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 certainly not uh it's not the post-war period so this is not the golden age we're very far away from that so but again on, on those two things i tend to uh, agree with you i think jamie Gobreth does have a paper with one of his students um, more than a few years ago showing that the fed really doesn't care so much about inflation and that it's unemployment that it's uh, in the target but you know i would have to check back on yeah, that I, but, but I, must, I, must, I must have missed it too yeah um so in the periphery so um I, and again, you know, here Esteban might be right when he says that I'm too driven by Argentina. So Argentina does have a peculiar thing, you know, Peronism. And uh, and so in the case of Argentina, you know, I think that there is clearly relatively strong unions that when you have a Peronist government in power and you have these depreciations and it's an external problem. We we never hike the rate of interest. There is a resistance in Peronism to hike the rates of interest for obvious reasons. The same that you know we have in advanced economies. High rates of interest are seen as favoring banks and capitalists. They which they are in many ways. 
uh, there is a, a sense that uh, you know um, that doing that is inimical to growth, although that's less clear because there are other ways in which you can stimulate growth even if the interest rate is higher. But you know, but fair enough. But there is that notion that it's somehow ingrained in a good chunk of the more Keynesian left, at least, and those have had and you know and are relevant within the context of Argentina. And so we do have the issue that we never, we are the country that never accumulated significant reserves. It's the only country. So the, the countries in Latin America that do have the external problem are the two countries that never accumulated reserves. It's Venezuela and Argentina. All the others are sitting in significantly large reserves and don't have this problem. The problem is that your forced, you know, the expected depreciation, given that you don't have reserves at the central bank, are large. Interest rates are low for this political economy reasons. So you have large depreciations. Everybody runs for the dollars, which is self-reinforcing, I'm sorry to say. And you have a left of center government that it's forced to uh, hike wages. When we had Macri, Macri didn't hike the wages. And so wages were compressed. So, so uh, the moments in which a left of center government comes, there is some recovery. I mean, this time, not as much as in the previous Kirchner governments, some recovery of wages. Um, uh, this time, not so much, but you know, uh, that, that pushes the wage, you know, uh, exchange rate spiral. And, and it is a reflection if you want of the political economy of, of an elite that is fundamentally an exporter of commodities, uh, and wants to be dollarized with, uh, you know, working class that, you know, um, has the strength to, to veto, if you want to some extent, this, this sort of, um, model, and we, we call it that you know, there was this famous Argentinian political scientist called um, Portantiero that he called it the hegemonic tie. So it, it was almost like France, Argentina. Every time, you know, the Argentinians score, and I'm going to say the Argentinians are the people. So Messi goes and score, then comes our the elites, Mbappé, and they tie the game. And it's impossible to, you know, so you end up uh, you know, on the penalty kicks because... It's eternally tied and you cannot get out of this conundrum. Every so often that leads to a significantly large crisis. So, so a default and, and, you know, and then the consequences are catastrophic. So, uh, so I think in that case, yes, it's distributed conflict. It's not in Brazil. Uh, you know, so, so Brazil doesn't have that situation. So, so it, it would be an exaggeration to say that this is the case for all peripheral countries. So, so that's why I said at the beginning, this might be influenced by the peculiar view and my lenses looking from from Argentina. I think it might, and you guys have to tell me, it might also explain for different reasons, you know, in terms of the political economy, because obviously the political economy in Turkey is very different, but, you know, it, it might, this kind of sort of time, which there is a sort of a push for depreciation and a dollarized, euroized uh, sort of elite with a working class that, you know, it's capable through other mechanisms, you know, sort of a, not, not Peronism, but, you know, uh, uh, to sort of push back uh, and you end up having this this eternal tie in which, uh, you know, the, the inflationary process is the result of this rather social conflict. So I, it seems to me that this kind of very high inflation, so that's my prejudice, that very high inflationary processes in which you have, you know, three-digit inflation, that those cannot be explained just by by demand or sh supply shocks, that this has significant propagation mechanisms and that those are ultimately connected to conflicted income claims and 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 that's what keeps this sort of uh, spiral out of control. So so in that sense, it's, I would agree with you too that it, it's not a good characterization for the whole of the periphery, but it is for, for some in the periphery. And and I put that there because you may have noticed too that uh, the the criticism of uh, of the heterodox uh, was sort of um, fundamentally a criticism of the heterodoxy of the MMT type that you know says that in the U.S. Uh, the issue is fundamental demand and you have to raise taxes, and then in the periphery they say. It is a question of um, you know not hiking the interest rate and and allowing, and I think that those are two mistakes. I don't think that the solution in the U.S. is that you have to, you know, uh, hike taxes for the poor, and certainly I don't think that you can sort of keep interest rates at zero in the periphery. So so that that seems you know, and I would say this, I would 
I, I would think that a policy of zero interest rates, not in Argentina, in any <laughs> in any peripheral country, it would be sort of a very dangerous policy. So the the idea that you can sort of let the exchange rate go freely and put interest rates to zero, and that you know, you can create full employment with a with a employment guarantee program and and not be concerned with uh, what happens on on the financial account uh, of the balance of payment uh, seems to be a, a recipe for for uh, a currency crisis. So so it, it it seems like that's what Warren wants to to engineer. Yeah. Thank you, Matthias. I think Nuno has a question as well. Yes, well, thank you, Matthias, for this very helpful, interesting, and I think convincing presentation. I enjoyed it very much and learned much. I just have a very small question on one part of it, which is when you mention people like Robert Reich, and when he mentioned the greater power of companies, that it has not increased in the last two years, so it would not be an explanatory factor for why prices have increased. Uh, I agree with the main explanation you gave for prices. I just wonder to what extent can that also be some part of an explanation for the following reason. Uh, I don't have time to read all the post-Keynesian price theory, so what I did is that I looked at Frederick Liu, summarizes it, it it's quite well, I think. And he mentions that companies, after you have price wars and you have some sort of a dominant company like we have in many sectors, they have the advantage of keeping stability of prices as they pursue other strategic goals, such as growth in sales or um, diversification and so on. And they say it's important to keep this stability because it can create some sort of confident relation with the clients and some sort of conventional framework where they can pursue other goals. My question is whether do you think that in the pandemic there was a, su a sufficient disruption of the whole situation so that companies might feel they can exercise their market power in a way that will be more effective than pursuing the other strategic goals while keeping prices constant. And to that extent, could it be the case that this also explains to some extent increase inflation together with the supply chains and other cost factors you mentioned? Or do you think this is not really a plausible thing to say they, they will not have greater advantage of exercising more market power now than before even given the pandemic? And my background, as I said, is the whole heterodox microeconomics that Fred Lee develops when he analyzes prices, because people tend to focus on the more macroeconomic aspect. And I was wondering whether this could be also a part of the explanation. That was the question. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nuno. No, yeah, I mean, so uh, I don't disagree. So let's say that you have the situation you described. So that things change during the pandemic in, in circumstances that the firm thinks that they can sort of hike a higher markup. What we are describing them is then a situation in which there was some sort of change in the market structure that they do have increased power and they're exercising this increased power. So that's fair enough. That could happen, certainly. And, you know, uh, there is nothing, you know, again, whether they can hold that or not, whether that's an equilibrium price or not, you'll find out. So if they can, you know, if they can go, so they're buying stuff from Amazon and Amazon is hiking higher prices and there is some sort of other online process that they can buy it somewhere else cheaper, they will probably buy it cheaper. So, so uh, you know, whether th that is the new sort of uh, markup that corresponds to normal prices, it's to be seen. So, but that would be a, a, an explanation on the basis that the market structure has changed and that you'll have a level change. So prices will be higher, but it doesn't say anything about the acceleration of prices. So it's a level effect, not a, 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 a you know, a rate of change effect, which is what you want for inflation. And that's why I quoted EPI and Josh Bivens, because Josh says, look, sure, mar profit margins have gone up. But what he's trying to, I, I should say, the EPI piece is not trying to show that it was corporate greed that led to inflation. He's saying a lot of the increase in prices are reflected in higher profits, uh, profit margins. Uh, and, you know, what he then goes to say is that, but it's unlikely, I cited his race, he says it's unlikely that this comes from significant changes in the market structure. So most likely this is because prices went up and they're just benefiting from that. What he's trying to use that is to prove that 
under circumstances in which prices went up because of cost issues, whatever, you know, shocks and whatnot, and the profit margins went up, it's unlikely that the economy is at full employment. So this, these hikes in prices are not caused by, by excess demand. So that was what they were trying to show. So I think that that's the correct interpretation. So there is a, you know, it's what I gave you. You know, the price, you know, the typical thing would be the oil industry. So they are price takers in international markets. They, they don't, you know, so the prices went up and sure, the profit margins went up, but that's the result of uh, inflation, not the cause. So it is unlikely that that's, uh, th that that's uh, the significant sort of uh, explanation of even the changes in the price levels at, the, at this particular point. So I don't think that that's, uh, that that's what's going on. And I think that, you know, and again, the, the, the jokey sort of title of price and prejudice is to suggest that I think that there is a confusion. I mean, there are good reasons on the left to be pissed off with corporations. Corporations are greedy. We have lived in a world in which over the last 40 years, income distribution has been skewed. Uh, you know, billionaires and CEOs of big corporations are making tons of money. And so people want to tax them, do this, that, and the other. And so it ends up being a good scapegoat ideologically for the explanation of inflation that it's the bad, greedy corporations. But it's bad analysis. It's not necessarily what's going on. And so so the alternative to the discussion that we used to have in the 70s, well, the consensus for good and for bad, there was significant difference in, you know, it's the man pull, cost push, how much is conflict, is that now we have almost everybody, you have post Keynesians telling you it's excess demand and we should tax the poor. And, you know, and then we have the left and more progressive saying it's evil corporations and we should do, you know, the notion, I mean, I'm not against taxing corporations, but taxing corporations won't, won't do much for inf and the price of oil is the price of oil. If it goes up, you tax, you can redistribute that. Uh, I mean, there are ways in which you can control if, if you have a large oil company that, you know, has a administered price of energy, you can give subsidies and reduce the price of that. You can sort of control inflation, you know, and, and for example, in the US, there were some, some, some proposals for taxes, reduced taxes on, on medications to reduce the price of those things. All of those are sort of good policies and I have nothing against those things. But the problem is if you have, you know, a significant increase in the price of oil, 30%, all of those other things will have minor impact on, on, on inflation. So they're, they're not particularly efficient. The U.S. has no way immediately to to implement price controls in the way they did have in the Second World War. The Second World War was a, a planned economy in which you know private companies were producing things for the state. We, we're not in those circumstances in the American economy. So, so uh, and inflation is not so high as I showed you. Yeah, in the analyzed based, it's actually below 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 target at this point, and so it, it is uh, you know. Uh, uh, on both sides, on 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 the right, an overkill, on, you know, too much contractionary because it's all seen as demand, and you have on top some heterodox people saying that, and on the left, these sort of impractical proposals for inflation, at least that might be relevant for discussions of income distribution and whatnot, but uh, they're not necessarily, you know, and they even get uh, also the the diagnostic of why we have inflation sort of uh, incorrectly. So I, I think it it. Uh, there are very few voices in the public debate that um, that suggest uh, you know have a clear analytical picture of why we are having inflation and and what should be done. And by the way, what I'm suggesting is that there's very little that should be done in the case of the U.S. Uh, in terms of uh, we shouldn't be that concerned. It's not a big problem. They cannot tell you what's the big issue with this kind of inflation. So why are we why are we doing all of these things that have little effect so so that would be my my sort of response but uh, but i think it's uh, uh we had a debate there is a conversation with uh, mark lavois exactly on on these issues and he used a lot of the post keynesian pricing theory to to discuss those issues it was in toronto and if you go to the blog to naked keynesianism it's it's posted there okay i will go there search and i agree with everything you said about the excess demand being something we should not be focusing on just with oil i will i mean with oil if you give oil as an example you had for example the debate of paul, well the critique that paul davidson made of paul krugman like in 2006 
when he was talking about Keynes and user costs, which is the same idea as Kaletsky's spec secondary speculative demand. So the idea that if, if oil is increasing at a higher rate than alternative uses of your money, there might be a tendency to hoard it. Uh, so uh, if you use oil as an example, I would immediately think of that as a possibility. But I've, I have no evidence that that is happening or not. So I was just wondering whether this could be an additional explanation and not but I, I agree entirely that about, excessive uh, demand is not. I don't know enough about that debate between Paul and and the Pauls, Paul Krugman and and Paul Davidson. I I I, I don't remember to tell you the truth. I don't remember exactly what Paul uh, was suggesting there. Uh, I you know. Uh, but yeah. it, it was just saying that if oil is increasing at the higher rates, that uh, for example the interest rate or alternative uses of money, you have an advantage of keeping oil in the grounds. So you are, in in some sense, speculating. You are, we we see the same thing that Kalinsky talked about many years before. It's the idea that you will hoard oil, you will keep it to yourself, so that and that will increase prices <laughs> and increase prices leads to greater tenants. I was just when you use the example of oil, it immediately came to my mind. I had not thought about it before you used the example, but these are just additional considerations to the main explanation you gave. I so yeah, sure. What you're saying is that the price of oil is high because of some sort of speculation that you know it's it's uh, better to keep it there, not 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 increase the supply at, at a particular point. So fair enough. Uh, my point was that you know, uh, looking at profit margin. So the graph. So when you look at this graph, uh, by you know, uh, not this one. So let me go back. When you look at this graph, the fact that uh, you have, you know, corporate profits in this particular period, 2020, 2021, corporate profits being big, this is not causality. This is just telling you how it's the breakdown of, you know, of what prices went up. So, yes, you're telling me that if their cost of production don't go much up, so their cost, the unit labor cost didn't go up, then the other cost of production did go up, but not as much. So a good yes, chunk are you sharing a screen? Uh, we cannot see it. Uh, oh, so I thought I was sharing the screen. Let's see. Can you now see it? Yeah, here we go. Okay. Yes. So what it's saying is that you know corporate profits did increase, you know, and the other you know the the non labor costs and the labor costs didn't increase much. What you have is that yes, a good chunk of this is explained by the increase in 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 you know it seems and you know it's it's uh, profits, but it's not causality that he's showing. He's just showing you he's just showing you the outcome. So if the prices are set in international markets, it, it you know causality goes the other way around. And so and I think Josh is clear on that. I I'm in favor of him. I don't think Josh is saying the same thing as as the other Robert Reich. So he's not blaming corporations he's that's why he said you know well look you know uh, i don't think it's this because uh, there's no significant change in the market structure so that that's not what's going on but i think that that number has led you know a, a lot of people to to this sort of conclusion that what we need to do is uh, you know in, implement uh, large taxes on corporations and and price controls and and you know uh, it it might not be feasible in the short run, maybe inflation vanishes before we, you know, we, we do any of those things. So it doesn't seem to me uh, to, to, it, it is very powerful ideologically. That That's my point. It's a good slogan. Uh, you know, as a slogan, it's, you know, inflation was caused by, by, by greedy corporations, but it, it doesn't seem to fit the actual facts. And so, you know, and, and I'm not even here discussing, which was your question, I suppose. What are the reasons why low prices are are sort of higher uh, at this particular moment? Um, you know, I, I'm I'm you know I'm I'm happy to just say that you know it was a shock. It is somewhat related to the war. Uh, there is obviously some some issues associated, perhaps the speculation, perhaps just to OPEC's ability to to you know sort of politically push you know for for higher prices uh, and and get a bigger sort of uh you know rent there so but you know uh, that's another discussion so it's not a discussion about inflation it's a discussion of what sets the prices of some key commodities
Okay. If there is Thank no you. question, this is end of the session. It is also end of the part, uh, first part of the global policy, political economy lectures. We give uh, some break, and uh, we will we have the the almost ten Greek names in the second uh, second part. So we start. We will start with the Mark Lowa on the uh, twenty two February two thousand uh, twenty three. Okay, happy new year for all. Thank you. Thank you so much so, for the invitation. Uh, thank you very much, but yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, I, Matthias. I have a whole bunch of okay. questions I'm going to ask you at the SSA. Yes, let's have a beer there at the SSA. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Take care.